Um, I'd like to start by just thanking uh, Kathy for inviting me today and congratulating the Texas Heart Institute and the Perfusion School for 50 years. I actually remember, um, like it was yesterday, uh, setting up the bypass room when I was a resident here and handing Kathy the bottles of amber cartridge using a primed pump. Uh, we were here probably at five in the morning or, you know, it's plus or minus, but um, Thank you again for having me. I have no financial disclosures today. Um, what we'll do today is actually uh, pick up where Ken left off yesterday and continue the story of cerebral auto regulation. Um, I, get to, I get the pleasure of doing the fun part, which is the clinical outcomes and kind of the stuff we're doing uh, today. So we'll start out by talking about uh, cerebral auto regulation and I'll actually frame it in terms of the clinical burden of delirium. Uh, next, we'll talk about how we monitor cerebral autoregulation, some of the neonatal monitoring that we've been doing, and the current studies of outcomes. And finally, we'll uh, touch on a little bit of the next steps in a real-time cerebral autoregulation monitor and some future prospective studies. So it goes without saying that uh, delirium has a large burden on our patient population in terms of morbidity and mortality. Studies have shown that it increases ICU length of stay uh, and it increases ICU class. But it's important to remember that uh, delirium affects our patients beyond the operating room and beyond the hospital stay. Uh, it affects patients for years to come in terms of cognitive and functional decline. This subject was so important that the European Society of Anesthesiology uh, created a task force in 2017 looking at uh, preoperative risk factors of delirium. This included things such as advanced age, comorbidities, advanced ASA physical status, uh, preoperative fasting and dehydration, electrolyte abnormalities, and alcohol-related disorders or uh, drugs, drugs with anticholinergic effects. Interoperative risk factors that this task force identified were uh, site of surgery, so major surgery such as abdominal or cardiothoracic surgery, uh, large interoperative bleeding, and long dur or prolonged duration of surgery. And finally, postoperative risk factors included uh, pain, which is very uh, near and dear to our hearts as anesthesiologists. <coughs> The same task force then broke apart the, uh, the components of a patient's hospital stay, looking at preoperative, interoperative, and postoperative factors, and uh, looking at the various stages of patients as they progress through their hospitalization. Uh, what catches my eye about their algorithm is that um, there's not much that we can do as anesthesiologists. What they talk about in terms of monitoring are monitoring the depth of anesthesia and avoiding uh, too deep of anesthesia. And under the therapy options for anesthesiologists, there's actually nothing there, so it's an empty box. Uh, when we look at uh, different ways to monitor the depth of anesthesia, I'll touch on one kind of a large paper that was uh, published uh, in 2012. And this was a, a paper by Sessler that described a concept called the triple low. Uh, the triple low was a phenomenon he described where there was low blood pressure, a low BIS value, and low minimum alveolar concentration of volatile anesthesia, so um, a, a low uh, MAC level. He found that with um, two components of the triple low here on the right, there was a two-fold relative uh, risk index in mortality. And when all three components of the triple low were identified in a patient, there was a four-fold risk of mortality. And this led to increased length of stay and increased mortality. Uh, this uh, was further studied in a prospective randomized controlled trial where there was an alert system that would alert the care, the care team when the triple low occurred. Uh, what was interesting in this uh, study was that uh, there was actually minimal to no intervention by the care team whenever they received alerts of the triple low, and um, these alerts did not actually affect any uh, patient care or mortality. So I think this study um, kind of gives us an important lesson in terms of uh, using clinical decision support tools, and sometimes they may not uh, lead to the outcomes we expect. And perhaps there's uh, things that we can pick up and learn so that we can design uh, better clinical support tools for us in the operating room or the perioperative arena. So now I'm gonna shift gears and talk a little bit about autoregulation. Um, in case you missed Ken's talk yesterday, uh, I'll give just a brief one or two minute uh, background on it. And I, I'm not as smart as Ken, so I'll probably do it at a, a, a elementary school level. <laughs> but if you look at the um, graph here on the right, um, you can see that uh, it represents cerebral blood flow as a function of cerebral perfusion pressure. And this is a graph of, or a plot of the typical, typical autoregulation curve. And the center of this autoregulation curve highlighted in green is an area where there's constant cerebral blood flow. This is the area that we want to maintain our patients in because a blood flow is kept constant. Uh, there are various mechanisms uh, as to why this happens, uh, such as myogenic control, uh, neurovascular coupling, and pressure autoregulation. What we'll focus on today is that last component of pressure autoregulation. Now to the left and right of that green uh, flat horizontal line, 
those are the uh, those are the uh, the parts of the graph that represent the outside limits of auto regulation. Outside of these um, that green area highlighted in red, it's where the cerebral blood flow is passively dependent on cerebral confusion pressure. This is the area that we don't want our patients to be in. Uh, in this area, small changes in, in blood pressure will lead to cerebral ischemia on the left side of that graph or cerebral edema on the right side of that graph. Moreover, it's important to realize that the limits of autoregulation are quite variable among individuals. This is a study in adult congenital, or no, I'm sorry, adult uh, cardiac bypass patients looking at uh, the lower limit of autoregulation. Um, in this study of over 200 patients, uh, the lower limit of autoregulation was identified to be 66 millimeters of mercury, but you can see that there's a, a wide uh, interquartile range of 43 to 90 millimeters of mercury. Now, yesterday, Ken talked about measuring cerebral autoregulation using the uh, pressure reactivity index. Uh, this is essentially a, a correlation coefficient, a moving correlation coefficient that correlates the relationship between arterial blood pressure and intracranial pressure. Uh, and that bottom graph uh, is one patient's uh, cerebral autoregulation uh, graph where you bin uh, blood pressures and as a relationship to their pr pressure reactivity index, which is that moving correlation coefficient. So when autoregulation is intact, uh, the PRX value is negative, indicating intact autoregulation, meaning that the arterial blood pressure and the intracranial pressure are moving in opposite directions. When uh, autoregulation is impaired, uh, the correlation coefficient becomes positive, indicating that arterial blood pressure and intracranial pressure are moving in the same direction, meaning the vasculature is now reactive, or I'm sorry, not reactive. Sorry, Ken's gonna kill me. <laughs> so what Ken and Kathy did, um, uh, in the early 2000s was to create a way to measure cerebral autoregulation auto non-invasively using the hemoglobin volume index. So instead of uh, inserting uh, ICP catheters, you could actually use uh, the nears to, uh, as a surrogate of cerebral blood flow. So the nears are used at a wavelength of 805 nanometers, and this is a measure of the relative total hemoglobin uh, in the brain. Using the same math, uh, you can actually delineate uh, cerebral autoregulation curves uh, without, uh, or basically in non-invasive measures. So the question then becomes, we can now measure cerebral autoregulation, or we believe we can, does the intraoperative management really matter? So this is a, 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 a diagram indicating the various stages of a patient with congenital heart disease. And you can see that from the very beginning, um, there are multiple factors that uh, play a role in terms of neurodevelopmental outcomes. And I'd like to uh, kind of contend to you that we actually have a very important role in defending the patients to have their maximal neurodevelopmental outcome uh, and their essentially maximal potential. And one of the main factors that we can do is by controlling blood pressure. So can we mitigate neurologic injury? And I think we can. So uh, when we are below the lower limit of autoregulation, we basically expose the brain to ischemia, leading to paraventricular leukomalacia. And when we uh, are above the upper limit of autoregulation, we are, exp are exposing the brain to hyperperfusion or intraventricular hemorrhage. So um, I'd like to start by presenting a study we actually did at Texas Children's okay. Hospital. And we wanted to ask the question if we can measure autoregulation in neonatal heart surgery. And so this is a retrospective study we performed uh, using our data collection system. We essentially harvested the system and collected all physiological <coughs> waveform data in uh, neonates undergoing congenital heart surgery at Texas Children's Hospital from 2013 to 2018. Uh, the number of patients was 563 in this period. Now, as I mentioned earlier, to delineate, to delineate cerebral autoregulation, you need uh, two signals, the arterial blood pressure and near-infrared spectroscopy at the 805 nanometer wavelength. When we collected uh, these data, uh, we, we ended up with 169 patients that met our criteria to calculate cerebral autoregulation. We were able to delineate cerebral autoregulation in 145 of these patients, so about 87 to 88% of patients. Uh, this was kind of the background of our patients. Their, their mean age was 12.7 uh, days, and you can see the rest of their uh, cat diagnosis category and surgeries that they had uh, in the, in the uh, cardio bypass room. Essentially, what we did was calculate hemoglobin volume index uh, using the methods that Ken and Kathy described in their paper. Uh, we utilized MATLAB to do it on a larger scale and stratified the data by the patient uh, in their uh, age by days. We then characterized the lower limits of autoregulation and then performed linear regression to, to, to look at how uh, the relationship between the lower limit of autoregulation changes with age. So uh, this is uh, kind of a plot of our results. 
Uh, here on the x-axis, you can see uh, blood pressure. So it goes from zero to 100. So that's the mean arterial blood pressure. On this vertical axis is the hemoglobin volume index. So as you remember, uh, that's the measure of autoregulation where positive values indicate impaired autoregulation. And we've shaded these uh, values in red and negative values indicate uh, intact autoregulation. And we've shaded these values in blue. Um, as we shift the graph, you'll see a third axis, which is the patient's age. So in the far back, moving towards the back of the screen, it's a uh, day of life zero all the way up to day of life 30. As we begin retaining this graph, you can see that um, we were able to uh, create a, a cohort representation of autoregulation by uh, age. So the trough that you see in blue is where the patients have intact autoregulation. And then the bars that you see in yellow and then red are where our blood pressures where, they, where the patients experience uh, impaired autoregulation. And I know we had a question yesterday asking about um, how we delineate goal blood pressures for patients in terms of their neonatal bypass goals and, and their map. And I think this, this graph kind of highlights uh, two important concepts that I wanna describe. So as we finish looking at the plot, uh, I can now represent the graph in terms of their lower limit of autoregulation by day. And you can see that in this cohort from uh, zero to 30 days of life, the lower limit of autoregulation ranges from 29 to 40 millimeters of mercury. We also see that each one day inc increase in age corresponded to about a 0.32 millimeter mercury increase in their lower limit of autoregulation. But it's important to see that, or to realize that the, the uh, lower limit of autoregulation is quite variable. So when I look at this, this plot, it's very difficult to discern a, a basically a goal blood pressure for each patient. And when you factor in their congenital heart lesion, I think that adds additional complexity that needs to be considered when uh, defining blood pressure goals and targets. When we look at the percent time below uh, the lower limit of autoregulation, this is um, uh, broken up by age on the x-axis. And then on the y-axis, you see the average time that each patient spent below their lower limit of autoregulation. You can see that overall um, in, in our patient cohort, the average time spent below that lower limit of autoregulation was about 17%. We then look at the severity of time below the lower limit of autoregulation. This is a measure um, uh, in the literature uh, uh, kind of described as the dose of uh, impaired autoregulation. And it's calculated by how many millimeters of mercury below the lower limit of autoregulation you are multiplied by the amount of time you are below the lower limit of autoregulation. And what we see here when I look at, when I draw a dotted line, uh, at, which represents the mean uh, dose of time, uh, of time below the lower limit of autoregulation, um, you can see that uh, the patients who are younger, uh, basically 15 days and less, have uh, basically more severe uh, dose of time below the lower limit of autoregulation. So uh, what it tells me is that the patients most vulnerable are those 15 days and less. So now let's shift gears and look at some adult studies. Um, yesterday, Ken mentioned a randomized controlled trial in adult patients uh, undergoing cardiopulmonary bypass, and these are the results of that study. Um, this was conducted um, by Chuck Hogue and Charlie Brown, and uh, they looked at uh, a, a four to five year period and randomized patients uh, undergoing adult uh, heart surgery, uh, basically cabbages and valve repairs, uh, into basically an uh, autoregulation targeted group where they were able to visualize a real-time monitor of autoregulation and treat the patient based on that monitor uh, versus a standard of care group, which is basically no autoregulation monitor. In their two groups, they had about 100 patients in each, and as expected, the patients who had the autoregulation monitor, um, the patients experienced more doses of phenylephrine. So essentially the, the um, perfusionist had phenylephrine and was able to give phenylephrine whenever the blood pressure was below that lower limit of autoregulation. Um, and as expected uh, in this uh, <coughs> bottom row, you can see that the dose or the product of duration of time and MAP below the lower limit of autoregulation auto was less and statistically significant in that autoregulation targeted group, meaning that they were successful in um, having those patients experience less time uh, below the lower limit of autoregulation. So what did they find in their study? Well, in the standard of care group, there is about a 50% incident rate of delirium, which is about the typical finding that you see in the literature. In the autoregulation targeted group, there was a 30% reduction in the um, incidence of delirium, which is quite significant in this study. When we look at their safety monitoring data, they actually um, find that there's less end organ injury in the patient. And these were not primary outcomes, but uh, very interesting uh, to us. But essentially, there was less uh, acute injury kidney injury and less uh, death in the hospital. 
Uh, in the interest of time, I'll skip uh, the auto regulation monitoring in the ICU and BIS in the ICU. But now we'll move on to the kind of final part of this presentation, which is kind of real time monitors of auto regulation, which is really fun for us. So this is um, one of the monitors that we've designed to look at auto regulation in real time. And it basically takes the input signal of arterial blood pressure and uh, nears. And what I want to highlight in this is that um, it's a six hour window, which shows the six hour historical trend of your mean arterial blood pressure. And here on the right uh, is uh, the lower limit of autoregulation, which is 52 that the monitor has uh, delineated and the upper limit of autoregulation of 95. Uh, circled in yellow is the patient's current uh, mean arterial blood pressure. And you can see a, a tiny warning sign because uh, you're essentially below the lower limit of autoregulation of 52. And to the left here is the histogram, kind of helping you see how well you've done in terms of keeping the patient within those limits of autoregulation. Uh, so essentially, we believe that such a monitor will provide the clinical team with a real-time understanding of the limits of autoregulation and targeted blood pressure management in the OR. Next, I'm going to move to a video of the monitor in action. So this was a video I took um, a couple of months ago. Uh, this is a six to eight month uh, uh, patient undergoing a bidirectional Glenn in our operating room. And you can see that um, they're actually about to come off bypasses when I turn on the monitor. And you can see that the current blood pressure is about 47 to 49, and it was below the lower limit. And now the anesthesia team has uh, basically increased the blood pressure so that it's above the upper limit or above the lower limit of autoregulation. So, <clears throat> We think that such a tool can be very useful in terms of uh, helping us basically navigate blood pressure targets uh, in, in, a, in a domain right now where I feel like we're essentially making up numbers based on historical, uh, basically, experience of institutions. So when we go back to the European society um, and what we know about postoperative delirium, I think that uh, with uh, targeted blood pressure management and better real-time monitoring of autoregulation, perhaps that we can fill the void of uh, therapeutic options uh, to treat postoperative delirium and improve neurodevelopmental outcomes in our patients. So in summary, I think that optimizing blood pressure goals uh, may reduce the incidence of post delirium. There's no agreement right now on the appropriate map for individual patients undergoing a cardiopulmonary bypass. And I think that real-time monitors of cerebral autoregulation can identify optimal blood pressure targets. Uh, retrospective studies have demonstrated lower limits of cerebral autoregulation, 66 uh, in adults and uh, on average 34 in neonates. But I'd like to highlight that the, the, um, the range is quite variable. I'd also like to highlight that the bypass strategies uh, for adult versus neonates are quite different. And that's important to consider in light of all of uh, these discussions. Uh, optimal blood pressure targets may also mitigate neurologic injury and kidney injury. And so uh, to conclude, uh, targeted control of blood pressure and cerebral hemodynamics uh, may play a very essential role in the future management of patients undergoing surgery and ICU care. I'd like to thank uh, Kathy and Ken who are here today and uh, the individuals below. And uh, I guess we have some time for questions.